15, verses 1 through to 10. Luke 15, verses 1 through to 10. Let's read. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he eat the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that, in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a candle, <coughs> light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is God's word this morning. So, a year and a half, 10 million pounds, an artificial intelligence program, and robotic guard dogs. All to search through a rubbish dump in Newport. And if you haven't heard this story, a man threw out, in 2012, a hard drive. On that hard drive, he had 8,000 bitcoins. It's virtual currency. The virtual currency at the time was worth something like 40 pounds, so not a big loss. <coughs> Middle of COVID, 2022, it's worth 150 million pounds. So why is he searching so diligently? Why has he secured 10 million funding? Why has he developed an AI program to tell if it's a dirty nappy or if it's a hard drive? Why has he spent, why has he got robotic guard dogs circling the dump day and night? And why is he spending a year and a half at least of his life sniff, sifting through rubbish? Because what he has lost is valuable. But the passage we have today shows, that, shows us that Jesus sifts through the rubbish dump because what he has to search for is far more valuable than 150 million pounds. It's far more valuable than a hard drive with 8,000 bitcoins on it. It's nothing compared to how hard Jesus is going to search and how valuable what he is searching for is to him. When we come to Luke 15, Jesus is surrounded by what is called tax collectors and sinners. The tax collector is fairly easy to understand. Um, those were simply uh, people who had betrayed their country. They worked for the Roman Empire. They collected money from their own people. They're like the modern day debt collector turning on their fellow man for uh, collect the collection of a TV fee. Or that's how they would have been viewed. Being a debt collector at the end of the day is just a job. Being a tax collector was just a job. Um, and the sinners, the sinners, that's a bit broader. Of a category that could include prostitutes, it could include, abu include abusers, it could include people who aren't Jewish, it could include any number of people in there. But what was important was these were people who were considered as having given up their right to have a relationship with God, as people you would never expect to be able to come near a holy and great God. So you think of the murderers today, the debt collect, uh, the, the the drug dealers, rapists, people we think could never in a million years be near God. So on one hand we have scum, but on the other we have snakes. Because watching Jesus' interactions are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These were the religious leaders of the time. And, and Jesus, he's already riled them up a bit, because in Luke 14 he's had a meal with them. And what he's pointed out to them is, look you guys, you talk a good talk, you, you have a very clean and neatly put together life, but your heart is dead. Deep down, you guys are, are hypocrites. So on the one side, we have scum. On the other side, we have snakes. We have snakes and scum. But Jesus hears their complaining. He hears the complaining of the Pharisees. Of why is he, why is he eating with people like this? Why is he walking with people like this? Because these were all signs of intimacy. Signs not just that you knew someone, but signs that, you know what, they could potentially be acceptable. And if Jesus was truly a prophet, if he's truly a teacher, if he's truly from God, he'd have nothing to do with them. But Jesus wants to correct their misunderstanding. 
So he tells them two parables. Two parables. Well, he actually tells them three, but we're only doing two today. So he tells them three parables, we're doing two. Um, and the question he wants to sh answer for them is, how do I, Jesus Christ, view the lost? How do I view those who are scum? How do I view those who have forfeited their relationship with God? He tells them two parables. And we have three points this morning. Jesus recovers diligently, Jesus recovers caringly, and Jesus recovers joyfully. Jesus recovers diligently. When you lose something, like your, your wallet, your uh, mobile phone, what do you do? Well, you, you first of all check your pockets, that's usually where it is. You maybe go and check your bag. You'll go out to the car if you had it with you that day. And if you still haven't found it, what will you do? You'll retrace your steps. You'll, you'll go, well, I, I usually put it down here, and then I walked over here for dinner, um, and then I went upstairs to, to cut my fingernails. And you'll go to all of those rooms, and all those areas you had been. And then as the desperation mounts, what will you start doing? Well, you'll go back all over those same areas going, I obviously mustn't check my pockets again. Uh, and you'll turn your trousers inside out to find them. Um, uh, and if you still don't find it, you'll go one of two places. You'll either go, I've definitely lost it, I've left it in, I, I was in Little earlier, and I've, I've obviously left it there. Uh, and you'll go worst case scenario that way. Or you'll start to point fingers. If you live with someone, you'll go, you've obviously moved it. You've taken it, you've put it somewhere. You mustn't have known where you, where you have, and you know what, probably the whole time it's been in your back pocket. Um, but that's what you do. If you lose something that's important to you, if you lose something that you need, if you lose something that's valuable, you'll search for it, and you won't give up searching. <coughs> and that's what Jesus talks about in these parables. Jesus compares himself to the shepherd and to the widow. And he tells two parables. The first, a shepherd. He's a middle-class shepherd, so he has a reasonable amount of sheep, about 100 sheep. And one of them wanders off. One of them crosses the hill, goes towards the cliffs, goes into the desert, and goes missing. And what do we read the shepherd does? In verse 4, he leaves the 99. Uh, and listeners at the time would have understood he would have left them with somebody. He doesn't just abandon them, otherwise you're losing 99 sheep as well as, as one. Wouldn't be the best shepherd. But Jesus is a good shepherd, so he leaves the 99 with someone. And he goes into the open country, it says. He goes after the sheep until he finds it. So this sheep could be wandering for two days, three days. He could be over hills. He could be over mountains. He could be in the desert at this point. He could went into foreign lands. What does a shepherd do? He keeps searching. He makes sure no road is left uncovered. He makes sure no desert plain is left unscanned. He goes back over where the sheep could have wandered. The shepherd searches diligently until he finds him. In the second parable, though, we have a woman. Uh, this was a peasant woman, and she has ten coins. And these ten coins are her life saving. This is everything she has. Apart from the clothes on her back and the food in her, in her house, all she has accumulated in her life, all her family have ever got in her life, are these ten coins. And she loses one. And the description we get here of how the woman searches is even more in depth than the shepherd. Look at verse 8 with me. Jesus says, look, she lost her one coin. She lost 10% of her life savings. What's she going to do? She's going to light a lamp so she can look in every single corner of her house. Every bit that has no light coming in naturally. She wants to make sure she hasn't lost her coin in there. She's going to sweep the floor just in case it's lying under a piece of dust just in case there's something obscuring it. And she's going to search carefully, Jesus says, until she finds it. That means she's going to move every bit of furniture. She's going to lift it up, get some of the pier underneath. She's going to make sure she hasn't thrown it in the bin. She's going to check everywhere to make sure she has not lost her coin. So Jesus recovers diligently. He's comparing himself to the shepherd. He's comparing himself to the widow. And he's saying, I have come to search for I have come to search for the lost in every single place I can find them. <clears throat> he's answering the Pharisees here because they're wondering, why haven't you just come to us? Why haven't you come just to the righteous sheep of Israel? Why have you come to these tax collectors and these sinners? Why have you come to these scum? And Jesus' answer is 
I view the lost as, as valuable. I view them as needing saved. I've come to save as many as I can. That means no corner is being left unturned. Nowhere is being left unswept. So he's, he's battling against the, the heart of the Pharisees. And as Christians, this is something that maybe we wrestle with. We come to church every week. We, we have good friendship. We have good, good fellowship with one another. But within our, each of us, there's a tiny strain that just looks at other people and goes, you know what, you're not worthy. That when we look at those who do not know Jesus, we're not grieved like Jesus to go search for them and to go hunt them down until we find them. Instead, we're going, well, it makes sense that you don't want to come to church. It makes sense that you don't want to come to Jesus. There's a certain respectability, maybe, to them that, that's missing, that we think, you know what, well, that's obviously why you don't want to know Jesus. And not just the extreme cases. Uh, it's not just those who are drug dealers, those who uh, work on OnlyFans. It's not just those people that we have in mind. It's often those who maybe have no light goals, who who are have lower aspirations, who uh, maybe don't dress the same as us. They, they might wear tracksuits everywhere. They might wear rags everywhere, but we, 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 we don't approach them or pursue them with the same vigor we should. We don't pursue them like a shepherd who has lost his one sheep, who wants to go over every single hill until they find him. And, and Jesus' question to the Pharisee when he tells these par parables is, how do you guys view the lost? How do you view the lost? He's asking them. And the answer of the Pharisees would be missing forever. They have no concept of these people being able to come to God. So they overlook them, or they say they're missing forever. And sometimes that pulls in our hearts, because people are different than us. Because they're not as, maybe, uh, they don't have the same characteristics as us. We think they're lost forever, they're missing forever. We overlook their ability to come to Christ. Their ability, the ability of Christ to draw them to himself. And the best way to correct that is to understand this mercy Jesus shows for the sheep, for the coin, that's the same mercy he showed for me and for you. When he looked at the 99 there and he seen one missing, that's each of us here. He showed that same mercy for us. And if we understand Jesus' mercy for me and for you, then our response will not be to look at the lost as hopeless cases, but to look at them as potential sheep for the shepherd, as potential coins in his treasury. So Jesus recovers diligently, but he also recovers caringly. He recovers caringly. And if you notice what he does with the sheep, for example, it doesn't say much here about the, the old woman, but Look at, the, look at how the shepherd pursues his sheep. In verse 5 it says, When he finds him, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. The shepherd doesn't grumble and doesn't complain that he has to go through these lengths to find his sheep. And likewise, Jesus does not grumble or complain that he has had to come to earth to find his sheep, to pursue his sheep. Instead, what does the shepherd do? When he finds his sheep, he rejoices. And he looks at his sheep and he goes, you're not able to make the journey back to the flock. And what does he do? He doesn't complain. He doesn't leave him here. He doesn't say, you're too heavy. There's too much baggage with you. To the sheep. You're too woolly. <clears throat> no, he picks him up and he carries him home. He brings him all the way back to his flock. And, and in Luke 15, Jesus tells, as we said, three parables. We're only dealing with two. In the first one, he's lost, a shepherd has lost one of 100 sheep. In the second parable, a woman has lost 10 of one coin. So in the first one, you could, you could deal with that loss, couldn't you, if you're a shepherd? You could deal with losing one sheep. Jesus doesn't, but you could. That sheep is not as valuable because you have 99 other ones. For the woman with the coin, though, she only has 10, 10 drachmas. That's her life savings. So it's already increasing the value. It's more valuable that she, she needs to find that coin. But the next parable she said, he, Jesus tells, is about a father who loses one of his two sons. So not only does the value of the items increase, but the, the, the amount gets smaller, so they become even more valuable. And what Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees is, is this. Look, even if only one went missing, even if only one went missing, they are still valuable to me. 
But as he increases the value, as he moves from a sheep to a coin to a son, he's also increasing the value of the loss. He's showing D, this is how special they are. So even if one goes missing, I will hunt them down. But they are also incredibly important to me. They're not just sheep. They're not just money to me. They are sons and daughters. They are people. So Jesus places incredible value on those who would be considered scum. Jesus, Jesus doesn't just see their value, but he makes them value. Because remember, the Pharisees, what they're, what they're talking about, it's not hidden to Jesus. It's obvious to them who these people are, the tax collectors, the sinners. It's obvious what their sins are. But that is so much clearer to Jesus. He sees each and every bit of that. He knows, he knows the depths of their sin. He knows how far away they are from God. He knows, he knows everything they've, they've done. He's not, he's not, he's not dumb. But Jesus sees their value, and in fact, he makes them valuable. Because he hunts them down. And when Jesus says he hunts them down, he's not just talking about going out to preach them in their towns. Remember, this is the second person of the Trinity. This is God the Son, who lived in perfect, perfect love and perfect peace with the Father and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> perfectly content and perfectly happy. Yes, what does Jesus do? The Father sends the Son. The Son willingly comes. And we talked at the start about searching through a rubbish dump for £150 million. But Jesus doesn't just come to a rubbish dump. He comes to skip on fire. And he, he willingly and joyfully dives in. See, he sees their value, but he also makes them valuable by bringing them back to the flock by bringing them back to God, by recovering <laughs> them for himself. <laughs> and look, maybe you've grown up in a home where um, there was never really much expected of you. Um, your, your father, your mother, they, you had a sibling and they thought, they'll do well in life. But they had no expectations of you. They, they thought, you know what, if you get a job and if you, if you survive, that's enough. You always felt a tiny bit worthless. Maybe, uh, maybe you're someone here who has, has been a Christian all your life and you, you see the, the way others live and you, think, and you think of one or two moments in your life that you have sinned, you have failed. Uh, maybe you've slept around a bit. Maybe you, you haven't, you haven't you've burst out in anger in ways that you think that would be shameful and I wouldn't expect anyone else here to do that. You, you're abusive, you were abusive to your, your kids, your, your family. Um, you, lived, you did sins that would disgrace anyone else. And you think, that, that makes you worthless. Or maybe because of mental health, you just feel absolutely pointless. You feel like your existence does not matter. What Jesus is showing here to the tax collectors and the sinners, to the Pharisees, to us, is that we are valuable. In fact, we are so valuable, the Son of God pursues us. He searches diligently and he recovers caringly. And as we will see, he recovers joyfully. So God sees our value and he makes us valuable. He sees the dirt in our lives and he thinks, I can redeem you, I can recover you. And what Jesus is doing here, what Luke is recording here for us, is a completely new idea. See, where the Pharisees went wrong is... They thought these people had forfeited their right to know God. But that, it's, it's, it's nuanced. Because that does not mean they could never repent and return to God. They could scrub up their lives, they thought. They could, they could renounce their tax collecting. They could renounce their sinning. And they could beg God for mercy. So it isn't that they thought they couldn't come to God and hope to be forgiven. The new idea that Jesus introduces here is that that sinners do not need to come to God, but that God comes to sinners. Sinners do not need to come to God, but that God comes to sinners. So we're asking the question, why are they valuable? Why are we valuable? Why are you valuable? It's because God pursued you, because God drew near to you, and because God has recovered and redeemed you. Sinners do not need to draw near to God, but God draws near to sinners. Sorry, got that in the wrong order. 
Uh, and our, and our last point, Jesus recovers joyfully. Jesus recovers joyfully. Look at verses 7 and 10 with me. 7 and 10. The conclusion Jesus draws about how the shepherd will react, how the woman will react, is they will throw a party. And this is the most unrealistic part of the parable. The parables often go that way. And Jesus is making a specific point about how God reacts. Because he's, he's looking at the Pharisees. He's looking at the teachers of the law, the, the religious leaders, the religious elite of the time, the most dedicated to God in that nation. And he, he sees them miserable, grumbling, complaining. And what they're really doing is watching the party from the outside. They're peering through the window and scoffing while they're freezing outside. They're maybe on social media, scowling every time they see a picture of them together. What Jesus points out is, look, you guys might be, might be miserable with this, but God is delighted by this. And, and first he says that heaven will rejoice. And next he says in verse 10, the angels will rejoice. And he doesn't mention God rejoicing here directly, but if you are an angel in God's presence, you couldn't even sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star unless it made him happy. And likewise, you could not dance, you could not celebrate, you could not sing, you could not throw a party in God's presence unless it is something that pleases him. So he's saying by the angels, and as he mentions heaven, he's saying, this is what makes God happy. To see those who are lost, those who are hopeless, redeemed, recovered, found, and restored. And as Jesus is defending his eating at the same time, he's saying, the meals we eat together, they're meals so often of celebration. Why? Because some of these tax collectors, some of these sinners, have been recovered for God. So he invites the Pharisees then to celebrate with him or to be condemned by him. To stay outside and be miserable and miss out on what God is doing or to come and join him, to view the loss as he views them and to celebrate, to join in the mission. And if you've ever seen any art restoration pieces, the purpose of restoring an art piece, isn't it, is to, restore, to bring it back to its former glory, to, to show its full shades of all its beauty, to take away the darkness from it, to, to touch up the parts that have been broken, that have been ripped, that have been worn down with time, and to put it on display so the world can marvel, can see its beauty. Uh, and there's an example you have on one side, it's darker, on the other side it's brighter, the colours are more vivid, and you're getting what the artist originally intended. You're getting those shades of blue, for example, that you don't see on the other side. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's taking those who have been lost, and he's recovering the original image of God in them, recovering their beauty, and covering them with himself for the world to see. And that's what evangelism is all about. Evangelism is founded in the joy of recovery. That's what Daryl Box says um, when he's talking about this passage. Evangelism is founded in the joy of recovery. And that's what Jesus invites the Pharisees to join into. And it's what Luke records this passage to encourage us to. He invites us to view the loss as Jesus views them. And then to join in with Jesus, his mission. So that we can, we can celebrate when one sinner repents. When one person who walks past those, those glass windows every single week comes in and says they know God. That's what Jesus is inviting us to do. To, to pursue the lost diligently. To care for the lost as we recover them. And to joyfully rejoice when they are saved. But what does this attitude look like? What does the attitude of Jesus look like? What does the joy of recovery look like in the modern day? Well, I want to point you to the example of Hudson Taylor. Uh, if you've never heard of Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary about 200 years ago to China. Uh, and at the time, there was a, no a great number of missionaries actually in China, but most of them lived in the port cities. And most of them dwelt, dealt exactly with the English, the European merchants, but they never dealt with the Chinese. And Hudson Taylor noticed this in his first few years there. Um, he noticed that the missionaries there looked like the other English people there, that they only worshipped with the other English people there, and that they lived lives that were a lot more lavish, lavish than the standard Chinese peasant. So Hudson Taylor quit the mission he was working for. He started to dress in Chinese clothes. He got his hair cut 
and Chinese style. He ate Chinese food and he used Chinese utensils. But not only that, he gave up his 700 pound yearly allowance and he reduced it down to 70 pounds a year. The same as a Chinese peasant. He lived in Chinese housing with Chinese people. And at the start, he was met with skepticism by the Chinese people. In fact, at the start, he was met by hostility. Because he decided, not only will I move out from the port cities where there's mostly Europeans, but I'll move to inland China, where no one has been before. So he was met with hostility. He was beaten many times. He was removed from villages. But he would return. Why? Because he, he wanted to pursue the lost diligently, like the she sheep, like the shepherd who pursues his sheep over hills, like the widow who sweeps and lights the lamp. So he returns to the same areas. And as time goes on, his message gets a better hearing. A lot of Chinese are converted. Churches are established. And by the end of his life, the mission he founded had over 150 missionaries, all working in inland China, in regions that had never been touched, that hadn't been touched by the gospel for hundreds and hundreds of years. But what was the response of his fellow missionaries when he initially started dressing in Chinese clothes, wearing Chinese hair, eating Chinese food, and living with Chinese people? It was a lot like the Pharisees. They said he was being undignified, unbecoming of a man of God, that he was bringing shame to the gospel. See, the person who cares for the lost, who views the lost as Jesus sees them, won't think twice about going to the slums of India and sitting down and giving up everything they have for, for the orphans there so they can tell them the gospel. You won't be afraid to live in a working class estate, even though you maybe have the money, you have the income to, to earn, or to live in, live in a better house, in a better area with, with better schools and, and people maybe who are more like you. Why? Because you want the people there to know the gospel, to have a witness for Jesus Christ. You want to pursue them until they come to Jesus. You won't be afraid to open your home, maybe, for someone who's an alcoholic, for who's home, someone who's homeless, and allow them to stay there for two, three days. Why? Because you want them to know Jesus. You're willing to go to those lengths. You're willing to recover them diligently, willing to recover them caringly, so you can <laughs> rejoice with Christ that they know him. What does it look like? It means at times turning down a better job. Why? Because you know in your company, in your office, you have good relationships, you have good friendships. And if you leave, there's no other Christian there. There's no one else who can bring the gospel to them. So what, what's an extra 5,000? What's an extra 10,000? When there are people who are lost, who do not know Jesus. But, but we would misunderstand the passage if we simply looked at those who are worse off than us, financially or socially. See, because Jesus is reaching out also to the tax collectors. And while most of the sinners would have been poor, the tax collectors were reasonably well off, but they were rejects in their life. And I think if you, live, if you spent any time living in any housing estate, there's a number of people like that, aren't there? Those who, who aren't touched, who are, who are avoided by most of the community, who, um, when they walk past, um, people always shake their heads, who... There's a number of rumors going around from kids about them, um, that they're crazy, that they, that any number of things. The, they're the, they're the, the, the reject in the housing estate. They might not be poorer than you, they might not be worse than you, worse off than you, but they are in need of Jesus. It also means getting involved with those who grieve. Because if there's one group of people that this world avoids, it is those who grieve. It is those who have experienced loss. See, we have our structures for it. Um, we're, willing to, we're willing to put up with our, our one week or two week. We'll do the visits maybe for a month. But what happens a year down the road when that person is still broken that they've lost their husband? They get avoided. So it means stepping into that and pursuing them for Jesus because we know Jesus is the only one who can restore and recover. <coughs> recover them. What that means then, if we're to think of how we do this practically, is we need to share the gospel actually with a lot of people. Uh, quite often we emphasize that it's good to, good to build up friendships, good to build relationships, it's good to have those connections initially with people so that we can slowly bring the gospel. And that is true. People need those connections. We're starting from further back with what they know about the Bible, what they know about God, what they know about who they actually are, which is made in the image of God. They're starting further back. 
but it does mean we have to share it with a lot of people because there are a lot of people out there who are lost. That means maybe if you're getting the bus, you're on the train, the person you're sitting next to, maybe have a small conversation with them. Ask them if they'd like to know. It might seem weird to you, but who knows? They might respond well, they might say no. We can respect that. Uh, it means that when you go into work tomorrow, uh, when people ask what you did for your weekend, well, why not share what you did on Sunday and what was so good about it? What is so good about the truth that God comes for sinners, that you do not need to come for him, but he comes for you? It means small comments to family members. It means if you, have, if you use social media, if you have social media, occasionally using that for the glory of God, sharing a Bible verse, sharing a tiny bit of your testimony, sharing maybe what you heard on Sunday. Because there are a lot of people out there who do not know Jesus. And when we look out into the world, we should see it with the same eyes as Jesus sees it. As sheep without a shepherd, as those in need of mercy, <coughs> those in need of care. But this passage isn't just about what has gone missing. It's also about the person who recovers, the person who finds what's lost. It's not just about the lost, but it's about the one who searches for the lost. And Jesus' attitude towards the sheep, if you look at verse 5 of me, and with this we'll close, is that he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. The reason for that is the longer the sheep is missing, the longer he's away from his flock at the time, the more agitated the sheep becomes, the more worried he becomes. And after a day or two, the sheep won't be able to be driven back from, by, the far, by the shepherd. He won't be able to, to beat him and lead, get him to go in the direction he wants. He won't even be able to walk in front of him to get him to go how he wants. The sheep is so distressed, the only way he can be brought back to his flock is for the shepherd to joyfully pick him up, to put him over his shoulders, to bear his weight, and to carry him for the day, the two days, the three days, however long it takes to get him back to his flock to get him back under the care of his shepherd with his sheep. So Jesus, he does not drive us, he does not pull us, but he gently carries us because we're not strong enough ourselves. This is what Jesus has done for us. It's what he's done for me, it's what he's done for you. He's carried us. This is the God who, who sinners do not need to come to, but the God who comes to sinners. He comes to us so fully, so completely, we do not even need to walk to him on our own strength, but he carries us back to his shepherd, back to his flock. Sinners do not come to God. God comes to sinners. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we come into your presence and even now as you look at those of us who have repented of our sin, you rejoice to see your people grow in grace. We pray that you would give us the same eyes as Christ for those who do not know him. We pray that you give us the same heart as Christ for those who do not know him. That when we see people walk past, we would ache, we would groan because we realize they do not know you. And we would be active in pursuing them for your glory. We pray that you give us wisdom and give us boldness so that we could bring them back to your flock for you. We pray that you would help us to rejoice joyfully in those in the past few years who have come to repentance, that we would celebrate with Christ the good news that the gospel changes and transforms lives. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to see the lost as Jesus used them, as sheep without a shepherd, as those in need of mercy, as those who do not need to come to God but needs, need someone to bring God to them. In Jesus' name. Amen.